Good morning. Welcome to the garden. For some of you, the first time this year, huh? Come out of hibernation. Glad you're here. <laughs> really glad you're here. Yeah, we've got a little taste that might be coming come March and April and May and June and all of that. So anyway, glad you are here with us this morning. There was an article in Forbes magazine that was contributed by um, a person named Sonia Kapadia. And in it, she recounted all the failures she did, had experienced up to that particular point in her life. Um, she said that she had failed to become uh, president of her high school class, that she had been cut from the first round of auditions three years in a row for a high school play. She had failed her AP um, American History exam, um, that she had not gotten any of the um, jobs that she had applied for, and that she had been rejected for admission to the top four top business schools to which she'd applied. She didn't have exactly a great track record, and I suppose if we have anything similar to that, it's easy for us to begin to get really discouraged and to think of ourselves as a failure. However, if that's where we are, we need to, to think about the fact that, um, that throughout history there have been those who've been labeled as failures, as disappointments, as uh, no good people. They're not going to accomplish anything, and yet they have wound up making some significant contributions. Let me give you a few examples of some that most of them you're familiar with. Uh, Thomas Edison, for example, was told by his teachers that he was unable to learn. And then there's the light bulb, which incidentally he invented after numerous, many, 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 many failures. Um, there's Albert Einstein, who didn't learn to talk until he was four, didn't learn to read until he was seven. Um, there's Walt Disney. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor and told that he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Oprah Winfrey was fired from her first uh, television reporting jobs saying that she just wasn't fit to be on screen. And then there's Dr. Seuss whose um, first book was rejected by 27 different publishers. And yet look what came of that. Now, there's some of us, I think, that are afraid to fail. We think that failure shouldn't happen to us, that no one should ever fail. Um, and if that's where we are, we're not being very realistic because that just isn't life. There's all kinds of things that I suppose could fall in that category of failing because there's loss, there's a, uh, a, a breakup of a relationship, there's a loss of a loved one, there's loss of job, um, there's suffering that we experience. And all of that could fit in the... the the category of failing or falling, uh, where things don't turn out quite the way we expect. And so we just need to think about that. that. That is a part of life. And there's really no way to avoid it. Unless, of course, we think that by opting out of life and holding back and playing it safe, we can avoid it. But if we do that, we aren't really living life at all. In fact, George Bernard Shaw said, a life spent making mistakes is not only more honorable, but more useful than a life spent doing nothing. So you see, it's not a question of if we will fail, it's a matter of when and probably how many times we're going to fail. When the outcome isn't what we expected, is when the end result isn't what we were working for or hoping for or trying to make happen. I suppose we could make a lengthy list of all the ways in which we failed, but that really doesn't move us forward. The most important thing to think about is when we fail, uh, what do we gain as a result of it? What is the benefit that comes from having failed? Now, hopefully, one of the things we learn when we fail is that it's not the end of the world that that sense of failure is really only a temporary thing. It's not a permanent state of being. And we need to understand that. Uh, it, we don't need to think that, that because we failed that we're a total failure, that it's not going to pan out to, uh, at, at all in the course of our lives. So it's, it's a temporary thing, and we need to understand that. And our kids need to understand that. Um, there's some conversation going around in educational circles these days about the disservice that parents are doing to their children if they try to prevent them from failing. Um, sometimes it's always telling our kids how good they are, how smart they are, how much better than anybody else they are, and we really kind of set them up to not be able to deal with the failure that's going to come because inevitably they're going to enter a world that's bigger than the one they've been inhabiting, and they're not always going to be on top. They're not always going to succeed. So it's a matter of, of helping them understand that and equipping them with the skills they need to, to come back, to stand up again, to bounce back from, from what's happening there. 
You know, one writer said the only way we ever recover from falling is by falling. In other words, we've got to fall down in order to learn to get back up. And that's an important thing to understand. That's something we all need to, to realize and to recognize and, and to deal with in life. Well, I think that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say in his letter to the Corinthians. He's, um, he's acknowledging that he has uh, flaws, fa- has made failures, has, you know, has all these things going in his life. There's a, a phrase that he uses, uh, that's used at least in his writing, it's called a thorn in the flesh, and nobody knows exactly what he was talking about. But apparently it was something he saw in himself that um, is a bit of a, of a shortcoming in one way or another. But yet he writes, and this is what he says, Now I take limitations in stride, and with good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, abuse, accidents, opposition, bad breaks, I just let Christ take over. And so the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Well, there's a couple points I think we can take out of this. One thing that helps him get through the failures, the, the, the things that don't work out the way he wants them to, is his faith, that he's developed that, that trust that he's not alone, and that God is with him no matter what he experiences in the course of life. And so it's his faith that keeps him strong. And the other thing you may notice is that he doesn't get down on himself. He recognizes who he is, that this is a part of life, this is a part of who he is, and he doesn't beat himself up. He um, uses those experiences to build on and to move forward in a positive way. So I think it's, it's important to recognize that there are mistakes, there are failures, but just because we fail does not turn us into a failure. In fact, Albert Hubbard put it like this, there is no failure except in no longer trying. There is no defeat except from within, no really insurmountable barrier save our own inherent weakness of purpose. Well, it's always important, I think, when we've had those failures, to to see what we can gain as a result of it, Uh, not to just write them off and keep going on and repeat the same mistakes, but what have we learned, what can we benefit from as a result of having failed? Uh, Bill Gates reminded of that, uh, reminds us of that with these words, it's fine to celebrate success, but it is more important to heed the lessons of failure. So it is important to learn from our mistakes. What did we misread? What do we misunderstand? What do we not communicate? Uh, to really try to analyze the, the failures the, that we've had and figure out why they came about and what we might do to not make the same mistake again in the future. We'll make different ones, but to not make the same one again. I guess what we're talking about is how we keep going, how we bounce back when we've fallen down, how we get back on our feet and keep going. Um, It's called resiliency. How do we become resilient people? Well, I've already named a couple things that we need to, I think, recognize as a part of that. One is to realize that failure is not a permanent state of being. It is a temporary kind of thing. A second thing is to realize that there can be some learnings that come out of that, and that can be very good and very helpful, so that's important. A third thing is to think about the fact that there's still hope for the future. There's still a future out there to move forward to, and that comes from having that that sense of purpose for our being. And in thinking about that, I want to remind you that we're going to be doing uh, another session of the spiritual, um, I've done this twice now, of our personal mission statement workshop. Betty Ellison is a very skilled facilitator and teacher, and she's going to lead this workshop a month from today, the 23rd of March, right after church, right after this service at noon, um, over in the guard area over at St. Luke's Church. And if if you really don't have a mission statement, Um, I really encourage you to think about um, participating in this because once you have this bigger picture of what our life's to be about, that can kind of keep us steady in the midst of those failures because it's the thing that always holds true and can keep moving us forward. So I really encourage you to think about that. So that's another piece that will really help us bounce back and, and be resilient. Yet one more thing that can really help us is to have a support system of family and friends. Uh, Certainly a a support system that will encourage us and affirm us and cheer us on. But we also need friends and family who will hold us accountable, who will be totally honest with us and and will help us uh, gain the best we can out of any failures that we have. 
Yet one more thing we need to do is really be um, conscious of the self-talk we give ourselves when we failed. Um, it's important that we don't beat ourselves up and get down on ourselves and keep replaying the, the failure over and over and over again. We all do them. It's a matter of recognizing that and letting go of it and gaining what we can from there and beginning to move forward. It really has to do with keeping positive and to realize that, well, yeah, we've taken a half step back, but we had taken a whole step forward just by the very effort, by the, 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 the steps that we took to try something, to do something new. And maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, but we've gained as a result of that. And then as we think back to our, our failures, it's important to try to figure out what we need to do to improve, to not make that mistake again. Uh, what skills do we need to hone? Do we need to be better at strategizing? Do we need to communicate a little more clearly? What do we need to do in order to not have that same failure occur the next time? Now, you see, this whole thing about the failures that we experience really fit into a, a much larger picture. Um, and the title for today, Falling Upward, actually came from a book by Richard Rohr that's called Falling Upward, A Spirituality for the Two Halves of Life. Now, let me give you a sense of what his basic premise is, and it's that the things that we achieve in what he describes as the first half of life have to in some way fail us or fall apart in order for us to ever get to what really matters, what really counts. And he says this is hard for us in our culture because we are a first half of life society. In other words, we really focus on the tasks, the actions that need to be a part of our life to, that we need to accomplish in order to live in any way, shape, or form. You know, what will we do to earn a living? Um, who are we really? What, are, what is it of value in us? And, and which direction do we go? With whom do we share our lives? That's first half of life stuff. And it's in experiencing that and doing that, uh, we have to do that before we can get to the second half of life. And I want to make sure you understand this isn't chronological. We're not talking about reaching a certain age. It really has more to do with maturity. And I guess that first half of life is more about success, as at least our society typically defines it. The second half of life is different in that regard and that it, it's a matter of realizing that we have this one precious life and how are we going to live it? What are we going to do with this life? Uh, what kind of contribution can we make? Another writer um, describes this, the same kind of thing that Rohr is talking about as a movement from success to significance. How do we move from success to significance? Success is like climbing the ladder of success. Uh, we may have gotten one or two rungs up. We may be at the top of that ladder. When we get there, sometimes we discover that ladder is leaning against the wrong wall, that it's really about something more than that. It's still, uh, there's still some emp emptiness there. So it's a matter of realizing that. And getting to that second half of life, um, spirituality, as he calls it, has to do with accepting all of who we are. It's accepting our strengths, our, the good parts of us, the wisdom we've gained. It's also acknowledging the warts that we all have, the ways in which we failed, the losses we've experienced, the suffering that we've had there. And all of that comes together to, to create the person that can then experience what life is really all about and live the kind of life we're intended to live. So you see what I'm trying to say is that failure is not a bad thing. It's something we have to experience. It can, as hard as it is, it can be really, really good for us. And sometimes it can even turn our world upside down to the point that we can really see what matters. And the important thing is we're not alone when we experience those failures. God is always with us every step of the journey.